Our next presenter is Dr. Ali Parasti, and Ali was mentored by Dr. Takeshi Yoku. Ali's presentation is titled, Linearity, Bias, and Precision of Hepatic Proton Density Fat Fraction Measurements by Magnetic Resonance Imaging, a Meta-Analysis. Thank you. I have nothing to disclose. MR-based uh, proton density fat fraction is a very good measure for liver triglyceride concentration. It's non-invasive, it's quantitative, it's objective. And it's simply defined as sum of uh, proton density of fat peaks over sum of proton density of fat and water peaks. Now, this has been very well validated, it's universally accepted, and has been used in clinical trials. The second flavor MR uh, density proton fat fraction is based on chemical shift encoded MR imaging, MRI PDFF. This provides with a pixel by pixel uh, PDFF map of the entire liver. Now one of the drawbacks of MR spectroscopy is sampling variability. And the fact that you can evaluate the entire liver by MRI PDFF, it makes an attractive option, especially for long-term follow-up in various patients. Now what is currently known about MRI PDFF is that it's in high agreement with MR spectroscopy and has excellent repeatability and reproducibility. However, the majority of this knowledge comes from single center studies, which is contrary to the current model of, model of medicine. You have patients who go to different hospitals, they get scanned in different magnets, different field strengths, under different reconstruction algorithms. Hence, there's a need for a multi-center technical validation of MRI PDFF as a quantitative imaging biomarker. Now, one way to do this is to uh, perform a prospective uh, multi-center study, which is expensive, it's pretty impractical. And in order um, to validate this, you also have to do a couple of things, which is based on recommendations of quantitative imaging biomarkers, Alliance of RSNA. Um, to validate this, you have to um, measure it against a reference standard. And this has to, this is against MR spectroscopy in this case, because we can't biopsy everyone. And the performance metrics are gonna be linearity, which is its linear correlation, the linear correlation between MRI PDFF and MR spectroscopy. It is the bias, which is actually the agreement between the two measurements. And it's also the precision. When you look at MRI PDFF, how is the repeatability, which is agreement between the measurements under identical conditions. You have a patient, you scan, rescan them. And what is the reproducibility, where you have a patient, you put them inside one magnet under one conditions, and then you scan them under different conditions. Could be different magnet, could be different vendor, et cetera. So the purpose of this meta-analysis was to determine uh, QIB performance metrics for MRI PDFF against MRS PDFF, including its pollinearity and bias, as well as its precision, and doing so under variable parameters, including field strengths, scanner vendors, and reconstruction methods. So we looked into the PubMed Medline Web of Science and the Cochrane Library, and the search terms are included here for the sake of completeness, but for the linearity bias analysis, the emphasis was on imaging and spectroscopy. And for the precision analysis, we looked into repeatability, reproducibility, precision, or agreement. We were able to pull 133 records. We excluded 110 because they were either analysis of previously published data, they were not in vivo human studies, they didn't meet the PDFF criteria. Specifically, they did not have any MR spectroscopy for reference. So that yielded 23 studies. Now, just some of the key criteria for MRI PDFF, all these studies had to qualify for these parameters, including their uh, acquisition sequence, the number of uh, echo times, they had to address the uh, fat spectral model, they had to minimize the TR, um, minimize the flip angle with respect to the TR so they don't have a T1 bias, they had to uh, address the T2 star effect. And then for the precision analysis, a similar model was followed, we had 91 records, we excluded about 80 of them, and we included 11 studies. Specifically, if the study did not have any repeated PDFF measurements, of course it was not included in the repeatability study. So this yielded you know, if you do the math, it's 34 studies, but six of the studies actually were common between the two analyses, the 28 studies were pulled. And we contacted the authors to submit their original anonymized individual MRI PDFF data, and they all did. We recorded field strength, vendor reconstruction methods, number of exams, number of acquisitions per exam, and the regions of interest, um, including MRI PDFF and MR spectroscopy PDFF. So over 16,000 MRI PDFF measurements were collected in near 2,000 patients from 28 studies from all over the world, USA, Europe, and Asia. Diverse population, age range from 8 to 89, including pediatrics, of course. And the average MRI PDFF was 9.6%, with a wide range reported from negative 2.8% to 55.4%. This is the linearity 
assessment of MRI PDFF measurements against their co-localized MR spectroscopy, which is a near perfect linear fit. You have a slope of 0.97 and negligible intercept of negative 0.07 and an R square strong fit of 0.96. Now this is from th over 3,000 measurements in over 1,600 subjects from 23 studies. When we look at the bias, this blind element plot shows that the mean bias is negative 0 0.13, near zero, and the limits of agreement are within 4%. If you look at the potential contributors for bias using a linear, um, linear regression with mixed model effect, you can see that the maximum potential contributor is about 2% for a vendor, and although these are statistically significant in clinical practice, one or 2% within PDFF is actually pretty good. Now, this, in terms of assessment of precision, we had over 9,000 PDFF measurements, and if we plot the variability, per subject variability, against the per subject average PDFF, the reproducibility coefficient is about 4.7%. The reproducibility coefficient is about 5.4. Now, fatty liver is a heterogeneous disease. If you take that out of the picture and look at per ROI level precision, the data becomes even more tight. You're looking at a reputability coefficient of about 3% and a reproducibility coefficient of about 4%. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that if you, if you look at the tan line and the red line, they're very close to each other, which says that the technical variability within the data is actually not very much. It is predominantly based on other factors. So again, we did a linear regression with mixed model, and we saw that the non-uniform steatotis, heterogeneous nature of the disease is the largest contributor to variability. The second item is just random noise within the system, and the technical factors are all less than 1%. So the data is very compelling that with respect to MR spectroscopy, MRI PDFF has excellent linear, linearity and negligible bias. It has minimal variability, and the contributors to variability are predominantly the heterogeneous nature of the disease and not technical factors. There are very good study strengths, including the large diverse cohort that it included. These are multiple studies by independent research groups. The variability in the hardware and software is represented in the data, which is what you see in the real world applications. And this is based on statistically powerful analyses based on original data and not summary statistics. One main limitation of the study one could say is using MR spectroscopy as a reference standard rather than histology, but uh, histology is very variable. It's 1 50th of the volume of the liver in a heterogeneous disease. That is not a good representation, and there's data on that. And for long-term follow-up, you really can't biopsy a patient every single time you want to measure their hepatic steatosis. Conclusion, we believe that MRI PDFF is an excellent quantitative imaging biomarker for liver triglyceride concentration measurement in both a clinical setting and for research purposes. And I want to thank this excellent team of collaborators. Almost everybody here is a world expert on the topic, and I uh, want to thank you for your time. We have time for questions. So I'm going to ask you an unfair question because I've heard this talk before and I've had a chance to think about it. So when you picked your 23 papers, um, did you uh, try to exclude multiple papers for the same group or did you include all of them? We included all of them. And go ahead. So how many groups were actually, how many independent groups were there in those 23 papers? So that was difficult to actually answer because, you know, we tried to figure out, and, and where you're coming from is if, Every single, if out of the 23 studies, 13 are done at UC San Diego and five are done at Wisconsin, then this is not really a diverse cohort. And um, that was difficult to answer in terms of how many centers are these because people moved around. So it comes down to about maybe like 15 or 14 different centers. There's definitely multiple studies, let's say they were done at UC San Diego. Or there's, Scott Reader does a lot of these, so there are and maybe five or six studies from Scott Reader and his Wisconsin group. But these people go elsewhere and they set up their own thing. So completely see your point. Ali, that's great work. Uh, you may want to mention which tool did you use to exclude or include. Do you use quadas or what did you use? Which tool did you use? Was it quadas? It's a tool you use to include or exclude the studies. It has a set of 10 or 11 criteria. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. You're talking about, I can go back through the slides, but yes. Yeah. Okay. I may have missed too. that. Yeah. 
I, if, so here's the thing. Let me go back to the exclusion criteria. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg on what we use to include and exclude. Okay. But yes. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Uh, did you guys adjust for the size of ROI? I think it looks like it's a 2D imaging. It's not 3D, right? So, I mean, the liver is heterogeneous. How big the ROI was? Was it one centimeter in every case or 10 centimeters? No. So the ROI were, we recorded the size of the ROIs. And the ROIs are predominantly actually within, let's say it's a two by two by two voxel for the MR spectroscopy. And the co-localized MRI, some of the, many of the studies included three slices to actually account for that. So all of that is recorded. Um, we included only the studies that had, I mean, a one, at least a 1.5 one, uh, by 1.5 by 1.5 centimeter voxel for the MR spectroscopy. There was, there was not a study that included a voxel size about 10 centimeters. They were all pretty much between 1.5 and 2 centimeters. So okay. Thank you. 